everyone, and welcome to Lifestyle Gardening. I'm Kim Todd, and we're happy to be here this morning for another great gardening show. Today, we're going to help new homeowners come up with a landscape concept, do some scouting around our current home, and we'll see what it takes to make sunken gardens here in Lincoln a beautiful garden getaway year after year. We're going to start today's program with a little practical advice. Our garden tools play an important role in the things we have to do in order to get our garden to grow right. So you treat those tools right, everything gets planted, trimmed, and cut with ease. Treat them wrong, you could have a hard time digging, pruning, or you might even injure yourself. So let's turn our attention to Master Gardener John Cariato. He's going to tell us the proper way to clean and store those garden tools this winter. Gardening is much more fun and easier if your garden tools are clean and sharp. Digging in the garden is much easier with a clean, sharp shovel. If your shovel is rusty and covered with old mud, it's gonna be hard to put it in the ground. Same way with your soil knife, which is an integral part of your arsenal working in the garden. Your cutting tools are important and they need to be clean and sharp in order to make a clean cut and not transmit any disease. A clean tool is much easier to disinfect and prevent any disease moving from one plant to another. Every year we hear about roses or some other plant that are infected from the first rose that's pruned and, not a, and the tool is not disinfected and the person moves on down pruning the whole row and moves the disease to all of the plants. So we don't want to do that. We want to have fun in the garden and we want the tools to be sharp. Cleaning the digging tools is really easy. All we need is a, a wire brush. We need to have steel wool or a steel wool substitute, which is less likely to abrade your fingers. Cleaning the cutting tools, because they get the sap from the plant on them, they're often more difficult to clean. And I use a cleaner, which is a uh, a citrus-based cleaner. This is the only one that I've found that works. It is designed for uh, woodworking tools that get sap burned on in the woodworking process. I apply that, let it soak, and then go over them with steel wool or the steel wool substitute to clean them. Same thing with the, the uh, loppers and with the head shears. Some of the tools are in better shape uh, if you get the tools clean in the wintertime, and this is in effect a, a really good wintertime project to get all of the tools clean and sharp and ready for the year. And if you do that, all you need to do is touch the tools up during the course of the year. And it takes just a few minutes to clean a tool that's already clean and sharp and to dress the edge. The tools that you need for sharpening are a little more complex. We need to have some kind of a file or a stone or one of the synthetic stones. These are diamond stones that will help you in uh, cleaning those edges and making them sharp. Now, in order to clean the, uh, the loppers and the head shears, you may need to have wrenches to open them up. The important thing to remember when you are going to sharpen a tool is that there is a bevel on all of the bypass type pruners and these are the ones we recommend the ones where one blade goes across another is that this side is never sharpened it needs to be flat this side has the bevel and this is the side that we sharpen so after we go through the sharpening and cleaning process the tools are clean they're sharp and they're ready to go for the next season. Sharp, clean tools means you'll spend less time cutting or pruning, and you'll even stop some of those plant diseases from spreading. So taking the time to clean them up and store them properly is really just another one of those chores that can make gardening a lot easier, and I wish I would do that to my own. Last week, we talked about the importance of landscape awareness for new homeowners. 
So this week for our Go Gardening feature, we'd like to help beginning gardeners come up with a solid plan for their lawn, trees, shrubs, and gardens. Taking into account all of the elements that are already present and then coming up with a plan of attack to make your yard a beautiful, welcoming, and comfortable space you'll enjoy for years is the focus of this week's Go Gardening. You'll remember that last time on Go Gardening, we talked about knowing what you've got. And if you did a really good job on that inventory and assessment, you'll have all those details down pat. Where are the hose bibs? Where did you pile the snow or do you pile the snow? How do you get into your home? What do you look out and see? Is your neighbor's property something you want to look at or not? Plants, soil, sun, shade, all of those great elements that make up a really excellent landscape. So the next piece of that is to figure out what you want. This is called the program statement and it's pretty simple. You can shoot the moon, you can brainstorm, you can scribble on a piece of paper. You can be very, very deliberate in your program statement and categorize it not by what you want in terms of objects, but what is the experience you want to have in your landscape? Do you want to relax? Do you want to garden? Do you want to entertain? How many people do you want to entertain? Do you want to have your dogs and your cats and your kids and all of the wildlife have a feast in your backyard? This is your property. This should be what you want and what you need. And again, we will then distill that down in the design process so that it's practical. You have to always begin also thinking about how are you going to manage this? So you can start big and then think what is realistic about what you are willing to do and what you're excited about doing in your own landscape. So the program statement also can be developed visually. Since this is a visual art, we explore our landscapes in many different ways. Go ahead and pluck off images that you find on Pinterest, on, in magazines if you still use real magazines, photographs you've taken of elements that you really like, whether it's a big, broad, beautiful landscape, or it's the detail of something like fountains or pavements or specific plant material. Then you take the list, so you've got a list of what you really think you have in mind, You've got photographs, you've got multiple photographs, and it might be many iterations of the same thing. It might be a fountain in a fire pit in an outdoor kitchen. It might be another fountain in a fire pit in an outdoor kitchen. It might be views and vistas that really have come to mind or, or have you know, made you feel wonderful in another space. You put all of those things together and then you distill that down into, in your own space, given what you've got, what do you want and what do you need? Because the next step in this process is going to be matching what you've already got with what you want and need so that we can start going into the actual conceptual development of where are you going to put what. That is the fun part. That's also a piece that really is going to turn out much, much better if you have taken the time to figure out what you really want. And a big piece of that is not only what do you want right now, but if you project out, are you going to live in your home for five years, 10 years, 20 years? Do you have a growing family and you will become empty nesters? Are you going to have grandchildren coming back? What are those sorts of elements that you wanna think about that are in the future so that you are not doing just simple immediate fixes to a landscape, you're thinking more broadly so that it really can become a space where you really engage and have wonderful experiences. Seeing your outdoor areas as an extension of your home will really help you as you think about these principles. Instead of something you have to take care of by mowing and watering every week, you can visualize it as a beautiful, peaceful area to escape to when you come home. Let that idea guide you to creating a valuable part of your own home experience. Our landscape lesson this week takes a look at scouting around your trees and shrubs for possible problems. The late fall and winter are ideal times to spot these problems because all the foliage has fallen off, or at least most of it. This technique will help you make better decisions for pruning and pest control. So let's take a few minutes to show you what I'm talking about. If you learn to really look at your landscape and interpret what you're seeing, you can find all sorts of interesting objects 
that are going to need your attention come spring or even later in the winter months. Let's start with one of the hydrangeas. This happens to be Annabelle. And if you look closely, you'll see that this twig in my hand, even though it is dormant, is still one that is nice and green. On the other hand, from the same plant, we have a twig that is obviously a different color and hollow. This one's dead. These will need to be removed off of any plants in your landscape that have dead material. Then we have Euonymus. And we have all sorts of issues associated not just with the seed production, but also with winter desiccation of the broadleaf evergreen leaves. And if you look really closely, you will see little tiny scale insects on this plant which is the bane of a lot of Euonymus. If we look at this Austrian pine, you'll notice that we have a decent terminal bud here. We have some remains of some pretty nasty stuff going on further down on the branch. And this is a, this is a tree that has had all sorts of tip blight issues as well as uh, poor growing conditions. A lot of people will find twigs in their landscape that look like this and they wonder what this is. Well, this has fallen off of a tree from way up high. It happens to be a honey locust, and this is the fungus among us that is doing its job and getting rid of the dead tissue. But that also indicates that you probably have some cankers going on. Look high in the tree or along the branches of the tree to see whether there is some dead and diseased wood that really needs to be removed. And of course, we end up with a lot of questions on Backyard Farmer and on this show that have to do with all sorts of wounding that occurred on the trunk of a tree that ends up not compartmentalizing properly. This is a perfect example of that. If you see these kinds of wounds on your tree, you need to take advantage of the expertise that we offer. We'll tell you what to do about it, and in many instances, that might be, you get to start planning for a new tree. Taking the time to scout around your landscape on a regular basis will help you control pest problems or identify pruning issues before they become unmanageable. Good gardeners understand the difference between healthy, vibrant trees and shrubs is as simple as getting out and looking at them in a timely manner. Last week we had a fun conversation with Alice Reed from Lincoln Parks and Rec who talked to us about how they care for sunken garden plants during the winter. Right now, we're going to hear from Rich Finke of Finke Gardens about the planning and production process for the rest of those ornamental selections. There's a lot of preparation involved keeping the sunken gardens beautiful from year to year, so here's Rich to tell us more. Here we are in the throes of winter, standing in a greenhouse, and it's my pleasure to be talking to Rich Finke, Finke Gardens, about exactly what's going to happen at Sunken Gardens this year. Finke's grows the plants custom, and people always want to know where those plants come from when they are looking at them in Sunken Gardens. So that's what we're going to discuss today. Rich, it takes a lot of planning to pull off something like Sunken Gardens. What is your involvement as a company in figuring out exactly which plants go in any single year? We are not involved in the planning. Steve and Alice uh, from the city do the design work and they will get that all finished up and then send me a plant list with quantities of each plant. One of the questions people always ask is, how do you start them? Where do they come from? Are they seedling produced? Are they in containers? Just exactly where do you get all these beautiful plants? The answer to somewhere is all over the world, that we will get plants uh, from Israel, from Mexico, uh, a couple other countries, and also here in the United States that uh, we'll get uh, plants from Colorado, which is fairly close, and you know down to Florida. Um, and these plants will come in many kind of shapes and forms. I try to grow as many as I can from uh, unrooted cuttings which is just a little tip of a plant with no roots on it. And I can get uh, 10,000 cuttings in one little box and root those into uh, little plugs and then transplant those. I'll buy some already rooted in uh, plugs and then we will take some cuttings off of stock plants. They always also want to know, can they get them and how do they get them? and who sells them in places like Lincoln, Nebraska, or are they just really something to enjoy only in sunken gardens? Um, I think you would be able to purchase some 
uh, here in Lincoln at some retailers, but I think there'll also be some that won't be available, certain cultivars which are new or underused that uh, a lot of retailers may not carry. And those you just have to go to the sunken gardens and enjoy there. And the final question is, do you actually winter over any of the plants that you then will use in sunken gardens? And if so, is that a process that you can rely on? Or is it sort of what happens, what happens? And you may be able to use those, or you may not. Um, I do not overwinter many coming out of the sunken gardens. But the uh, city has a greenhouse, and they overwinter a lot of the tropicals that were grown the season prior in sunken gardens. So their greenhouses are full of a lot of tropical plants that uh, they will divide and use again the following year. Thanks, Rich. We really appreciate your information, and I'm sure everybody is looking forward to seeing what Sunken Gardens looks like come spring. The reason Sunken Gardens in Lincoln looks fantastic season after season is because of all the hard work and planning that goes into it. It's people like Rich Finke and Alice Reed who care so much about beautiful plants and caring for them through the winter that does make all the difference in the world. So of course, we look forward to another great experience at Sunken Gardens this year. It's time now to answer a few of your questions. If you've got a question you'd like to submit to the show, just drop us an email at byf at unl.edu. And just like the real show, we want you to tell us as much information as you can including where you live, and attach those pictures as JPEGs. Our first question comes from somebody who didn't tell us where they're from, but this is a pretty universal question. And he is saying, it sure seems like bagworms are becoming more of a problem. Instead of knowing what to spray them with, he wants to know what animals or insects <laughs> prey on bagworms. So if you, if you notice on this set of pictures, this is a really a devastating issue for a couple of reasons. First off, this particular set of pictures shows a pretty negative landscape area. There's rock, there's landscape fabric. These particular junipers have been sheared and sheared and sheared, turned into a form that is architectural, but that can be pretty hard on the plant and cause it a lot of stress. Stressed plants will attract all sorts of insect pests and diseases, more than plants that are in good health. And you can also see bags still hanging on the junipers, and you can see some junipers that are not only not green, they are brown as brown can be. Those are former junipers. So, of course, an issue that our entomologists would talk about with bagworms is the control is difficult if you don't catch them at the right time. And that would be when those little crawlers first come out, when those little bags are absolutely not as big as these ones are right now. Right now, you could pick them off, you could squish them before the adults emerge. And of course, birds and animals and all sorts of other beasties might eat what's in there, but they're not going to go harvesting and just pluck the bags off themselves and eat them. So, I, I'm going to say, and I'm going to hope that if I, if I need to be corrected, our entomologists will do it. I'm going to say that the best line of defense for the bagworms right now is not to rely on animals or insects. All right. Um, our, our, our next question, let's see, this one comes to us from Omaha. Um, it's about a 20-year-old pine, 25 to 30 feet tall. It's an evergreen, obviously, it's a, it is a pine. It looks like it's probably an Austrian. It's been bleeding white sticky substance that turns hard and then to a powder. Lower branches were on the ground, they took those off. It's not a beautiful tree. It does not look like it's in the greatest of condition. And that's probably getting toward the end of its life if it's in a compromised planting area. It, it does provide shade and privacy. So their question is really, is the tree salvageable? And the answer to that is yes, and that sap that is oozing out of the, uh, that tree can be one, two, maybe three things with, with pines or evergreens. We can see uh, potentially some canker, which we have talked about before on the show. Pines are susceptible to a lot of borer damage. Typically, if this was Zimmerman pine borer, you would see that 
more in the, in the crotch between where the branch hits the trunk. And it would look popcorn-y and a little kind of yellowish, and this looks a little bit like that. Um, it looks like really the main issues with this tree are probably a compromised root system that's causing stress. Bore, a lot of bores get into pines. You need to pay attention to whether you have bore holes. You need to look at potentially a trunk drench. And the trunk drench is most effective if it's applied so that it can catch those caterpillars or those crawlers when they're coming out. And that usually is going to be kind of last part of April, first part of May for treatment for the caterpillars. There's another treatment window later in the season. That is for the adult, adults. But in the meantime, you know, the pruning, while it might have been really necessary um, for, for actually using your landscape the way you want to use it, the pruning wounds themselves can cause some stress on the tree. So as we go into spring, make sure you keep that tree well watered, but not watered too much. Go ahead and do pay attention to whether you have uh, sort of additional damage in holes in the trunk that may indicate some more insect issues with it. Speaking of pruning, we're going to finish our show today with a look at that part of the landscape management. Once again, it's easier to make those pruning decisions when your trees and shrubs are dormant, meaning right now. And as we said before, going around your home to inspect your plants for damage is really the best way you're going to know if something needs attention. Let's take a look at some examples of trees and shrubs that need a little or a lot of pruning. One of the best times to prune landscape plants is when they're dormant, and one of the best times to actually look at those plants to figure out their structure is in the winter months when especially the deciduous ones have lost their foliage. This is a great example of what you are going to have to prune, and by prune this one, that means probably at the ground. A lot of our hybrid elms have very terrible structure. You can see what has happened here is literally half or more of this particular main stem has broken off. It's a poor attachment. There's a poor pruning cut here. There is actually a wound from the ripping part of the tree that has come all the way down the trunk. We have a lot of too many branches in one spot in this tree, which means that as they grow, they're going to be included like this, which means they're also not strong connections. We don't trunk thin, if at all possible, especially when plants are small, trees are small, they need all that foliage. However, you do look this time of year as well at anything that is an inch or less in diameter, likely time to take it off if it's not going to be something that will contribute to the quality of that tree in the future. There are a couple of ways to prune deciduous shrubs, one of them being into a hedge. This is a privet hedge that has been pruned this way for years and years. A couple of the cautionary notes, however, are you still have to look at the main structure of the plant. What you can see has happened over time is the pruning cuts to keep this hedge low have pretty consistently been made at about the same spot in the plant. The response of the plant is to throw out a whole bunch of shoots from that spot. You do that again, a whole bunch of shoots, and you end up with a very old cane from the base with little if any foliage on it. So ideally what would happen every three, four, five years, depending on the species, is you go into this hedge, it's very time consuming, but take out the oldest of the canes all the way down to the base of the plant. That encourages new growth to come from the base. You then feather cut slightly the top so you don't get this single stump with a lot of side shoots from the same spot in the plant every single season. This is not the ideal time of year to prune evergreens or broadleaf evergreens of any sort because they continue to transpire over the winter months. You open up those stems and that can cause winter dieback or desiccation. These U's are an example of what you can look at, however, and that would be think in terms of how much more this plant is going to grow come spring. So you look at some of the longer growth from last season, you can imagine this shooting additional buds if you don't do some selective pruning and heading back of those long branches, you can end up with very long floppy pieces of the shrubs that end up being susceptible to breakage or damage of some sort. 
that's going to be true for junipers, yews, some of the smaller evergreens, broadleaf evergreens like boxwoods. Take a look at how you can do that in such a way that it keeps the plant health. Of course, pines, spruce, and firs are a whole different ballgame. So what you really want to think about this time of year is take a look at what you've got in your landscape, look at the structure, look at where pruning mistakes have been made in the past, think about damage, think about growth in the coming season, and be ready to get those sharpened tools out, ready to start cutting, pruning, and enjoying the outdoors in these crisp winter months. Dormant trees and shrubs can be much easier to prune because you're not fighting to see what the actual problem is. Think twice, cut once, and remember that broken, damaged, diseased, or crossing branches should be pruned out as best you can. Thank you so much for joining us again for Lifestyle Gardening. On our next program, we'll head into the laboratory to see how samples are processed, and we will give you tips on growing those luscious peaches. Don't forget to check us out on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So good morning, good gardening. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time on Lifestyle Gardening.